<laughs> of the circle. I would sandwich you in. All right, you're ready whenever, Joe, right? I can just talk? Okay, cool. All right, so I'll just start, and Krista can make her way over. Um, so I'm Megan for people. I don't think anybody that's here doesn't know who I am. So, except I, I don't know you. What's your name? Sandy. Sandy. Hi, Megan. Um, I used to coach classes here. Sometimes I fill in. I do nutrition coaching here, and I run like a part-time private practice therapy out of the office in there. Um, so I'm a licensed therapist and uh, have the precision nutrition uh, certification for nutrition coaching, um, and I do CrossFit here. Um, so this is um, going to be part of like how we set up our maintenance challenge at the gym. So the holidays are typically a time where we can lose control of our weight, right? So the gym puts together typically every year we do the same thing, which is just like a row meters challenge where we're just kind of using the idea that if we increase the amount that we exercise, we can offset some of that partying that we do. But in reality, the amount of rowing you would have to do to row off, say like an extra meal, like a 500 calorie meal would be like an it depends on your body weight and your gender and muscle mass and all that stuff, but you're looking at like a half an hour to an hour of rowing to, to row off one meal. Um, so I was just thinking this year, and if you've been to the seminar, nutrition seminars that I've done in the past, I talk, a, I do, t there's a place for learning about nutrition, right? Like if we want to get into the minutia of macros, if you're, if you're a fit person, you're a CrossFitter and you're trying to be ripped, then yeah, we want to talk about nutrient timing and macros being eaten specific breakdowns. Um, but in general, or when we're thinking about eating and changing our eating habits, we're thinking about more like our habits, our lifestyle, like what makes us eat at certain times and what happens to our brains and bodies when we eat certain foods. Like I talk a lot about sugar and flour being highly addictive and they sort of hijack your brain in such a way that it makes you overeat. It makes you crave more. So steering clear of those types of foods could be more important for somebody that's trying to maintain or lose weight than eating a specific macronutrient breakdown for that person. So I wanted to throw something into the maintenance challenge that does a little bit on the front end rather than trying to react to overeating, right? That's what we've kind of done is this, let's offset the overeating and the sugar and the flour that we're taking in over the holidays. Instead of, or in, in addition to that offsetting it, let's actually maybe try to be more conscious about the choices that we are making when we go to parties. Um, how much do you really want to eat? Is it, is it worth it to eat that much or that substance? Um, so that way we might not have to offset so much. Does that make sense? So to do that, we just have to increase our awareness of ourselves, right? Awareness of our tendencies and our habits and why we do things the way we do and how we feel after we eat something is all going to help us sort of change this autopilot that we're all on. And meditation is one of the best ways to change that. Um, I'll start by saying, um, I want to try to, uh, I'll start by saying I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I wish more people that were about to talk about religion would start that way. <laughs> um, because meditation is a religious practice. It's Buddhist practice, generally. Um, so I don't want to put people off by, by saying we're going to use this religious practice to help us be healthier. Um, but that is what we're going to do. Um, I want to try to appeal to, some people get put off by that if they're more like, thinking, sensing people, right? They're, they're more concerned with like things that we know, like, like things that are in front of us, concrete things. And some people by nature are more interested in emotions and they, they make decisions based on feeling and intuition. And I wanna appeal to both of those types of people. So probably some of you are more thinking concrete people, right, logical oriented. And some of you are probably more feeling, sensing, could be more into this hippy dippy stuff than the other people. And so I'm going to talk about both sides of it so that everybody can kind of get something out of this, if that makes sense. So if you are, if I do say something that like re some of the stuff I say, you might feel like you have a question about, um, you kind of understand it. Like what I'm saying sort of makes sense. You, you can feel, you feel like some of the things I'm saying are true. And I guess I just encourage you to kind of like let that be enough for today. Cause some of the things, that I talk about your thinking logical mind is gonna have trouble grasping 
And that is actually like the point. So just keep that in mind. All right. So this is a, a quote. Most of the stuff I talk about today is from a book called um, Buddha's Brain, The Practical Neuroscience of Happiness, Wisdom, and Love. And it, it's just a lot of like evidence research based um, information about what's happening when we're meditating and when you're thinking a certain type of way. So this is a quote from the book that said, it says, the issue is not a lack of resources, it's a lack of will and restraint, of attention to what's truly happening and of enlightened self-interest. So that's kind of what I was just saying. It's not that we don't know how to eat healthy. We have access to many resources, right? We come to nutrition seminars and we work out in this gym. We know what's healthy for us. And yet we still go out and do some things that aren't in our best interest. So most diets fail. Why is that? It's because we are surrounded by things that are constantly pulling us away a lot of the time from what's in congruence with our highest version of ourself. So how do we get back to that? How do we kind of resist? How do we pause and restrain ourselves from giving into that? So that's like what we're gonna talk about. So fuck it, right? That's, the, that's what normally happens um, through the holiday seasons. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people, when they're thinking about dieting, we're thinking about willpower, right? I'm going to use my willpower to withstand these temptations around me. I'm not going to have that cookie. I'm going to keep myself from doing that. And if you've been to the earlier nutrition seminars, I've talked about willpower as being an exhaustible resource. It's not something that some people just have more of and other people just don't. It's not that some people are strong and some people are weak. It's that some people's willpower gets depleted, right? Things that exhaust willpower decision making, right? So if you're someone that has to make a lot of decisions, that's actually going to exhaust your ability to restrain yourself from doing something that you would otherwise not want to do. Uh, demands on your time and energy, right? Being busy, not having enough downtime for yourself. Exposure to temptation, right? Being at parties um, and in an increased need for restraint. So when you say you're going to go on a diet, that's actually going to take away some of your willpower. The act of trying not to do something depletes your willpower. This is why at the end of a long day, right, we say fuck it and we eat the bowl of ice cream because we had a fucking long day and we made a lot of decisions and we didn't eat the cookies at the snack table at lunch. So we get, it gets worn out. Um, the holidays are exposing you to all, all of that, right? So <clears throat> we're going to try to do things that encourage, that, that rebuild willpower. So before I tell you guys how to meditate, which I'm going to tell you how to do, um, and the idea is that, you know, we're going to do the meters challenge. I think it's, is it 50,000, Krista? 50,000 meters, 100, 100 push-ups? Push 500 push-ups. 50-day span. 50 span, right. 50,000 meters, 500 push-ups, and five minutes of day, five minutes a day of meditating. But I'm also open to kind of breaking up the meditation the same way we break up the meters, right? So if you miss a day of meditation, you could just meditate 10 minutes the next day to, to equal four hours by the end of the 50 days. The idea is to get to four hours of meditation by the end of the 50 days, in addition to your 50,000 meters and your 500 push-ups. All right, so let me kind of break this down so we can understand what we're doing when we're meditating. All right, this is going to be a little bit of the hippy-dippy stuff. So now I'm going to appeal to these, um, these intuitive feeling people in the room in a way. So you have your physical body, right? We know that's here. I can see it. I can feel it. Concrete people like this. This exists. This brings me pleasure and pain, both, right? I have my thinking mind. If you cracked it over my head, you could see my brain. I know it's there. Again, my logical people, yes, this is true. I like that. I know it's there. Also causes me pleasure and pain, right? Uh, then I like, I invite you to consider the third part. Like I said, I don't know what this third part is. I don't know that it exists for sure. Um, there, actually, the more and more I learn about this, the more I start to think that this third part or third state of mind is really actually just like a synergy between all parts of your brain and your body. I think there's a lot that we as human beings don't understand about the brain. So the brain has tripled in size, I think, in the last, I can't remember if it's 3 million or 3 billion years. It's constantly growing and changing and getting better and better at functioning. So I just, I feel like there's things that we can do that we maybe aren't even aware that we can do. But let's just think about this, this third part as something that's separate from your physical body and your thinking mind alone. Um, 
Sometimes this third part is explained as a spiritual place. Some people might say, yes, that's your soul, that's your consciousness. Um, this third part has the ability to separate from and reflect on what the body and thinking mind are saying to it. So if I were to ask you guys right now to, this is the metaphor that I first heard for this, to pretend that you're like a cat sort of watching a mouse hole, waiting for the mouse to come out, that is like a metaphor for when you're the third part waiting for the next thought to come into your head, can you hear it and notice it? So what this does is it gives you separation from that thought. So we have a lot of thoughts that are not helpful, right? We don't use all the thoughts that we have. If we are totally consumed with our thinking, then our mind can drag us around in a way, right? It's because it's constantly liking, disliking, judging. It's telling us to worry about this or that. It jumps into the future and, and it makes up scenarios about what's gonna happen and which makes us nervous now, or it goes into the past and it makes us regret something that we already did, which makes us depressed now. So when we're attached to that energy, it's dragging us. So the practice of meditation is pulling that third part away from it and just observing that activity without letting it yank you. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Yeah. So another way to think about this is, um, so, okay, so this says, you know, like science, Buddhism encourages people to take nothing on faith alone and doesn't require a belief in a God. So the idea in, in Buddhism is that the Buddha was not a special person. The Buddha was just a person who realized this and started to kind of explain this to people um, and, and that everyone's a Buddha. And I think other religions say the same thing, that God is in you, right? People say that. The Buddha is in you. You just have to access that space. Um, <clears throat> by whatever, whatever, whatever it is, by definition, it's beyond the physical universe. Since it can't yet be proven one way or another, it's important and consistent with the spirit of science to respect it as a possibility. Um, this is a, a study that's really interesting that kind of might make you think more deeply about the idea of there being, of us not really knowing what this third part is. And it, it was a study about people that, had their actual, that were actually um, blind and they showed them pictures of smiling faces and frowning faces. Um, and their, their brain centers lit up just the way a person who could see would. So, you know, our parts of our brain light up when we're looking at a smiling face. Parts of our brain light up when we're looking at a frowning face that are different. So they showed these pictures to people whose visual field was blocked. And their brains were lighting up in the same way. So they were picking up something from the, those pictures. We don't know what, how that works. The study... It's interesting if you want to read it, I'll email this to people or I'll put it on, you know, I'll give it to Barrick to send out. Um, it's just interesting what they speculated about what that is, is can the brain sense things? Um, are we picking up things in our visual field that are below our actual consciousness that causes us to have fe emote feelings and stuff? We, you know, there's a lot that we don't understand. So now I'm kind of talking about those two groups of people we have like our logical thinking mind, right? That's our brain. We have our emotional uh, feeling, emotional decision-making process, right? If you were, well, I won't go into that. The idea is to integrate those two. So I'm about to talk about that in a couple of slides down. Um, your emotional mind can be thought of as like your animal brain, right? I told you guys that your brain changed over millions of years, right? So we started with a lizard type brain. It's just your amygdala and your brainstem. This is in charge of your fight or flight. Is that the next thing? Mm. Yeah, it's part of your, I'll go into this, part of your fight or flight response system. Then you have your midbrain and that sort of is the link between the two. And then you have that whole wrinkly part, right? That's what makes, separates us. We as human beings, mammals, have that wrinkly part, the prefrontal cortex that helps us build things and project ourselves into the future and the past. So it, it's something that we use, right? If it's used as a tool, it's great. When it gets out of control, it, it can also cause us suffering, that, that thinking part. If we can integrate all of it together, we can use our feeling state and our thinking state, we usually are able to make more thoughtful, better decisions. So the example I usually use is like, if you were, if you're a guy be, buying like, if you're buying an engagement ring for somebody, if you were purely relying on your logical mind, you'd probably go down to the cheapest end of 
the ring case and you'd get the cheapest ring because you want to put that money towards something more logical, right? But your spouse might not appreciate that. If you're going based totally on emotions, you're going to go to the super expensive side of the ring case and buy an extremely extravagant gift so that you can make your loved one feel loved and whatever. That's what you're concerned with. If you're using both, you're going to pick something in the middle, right? It's usually a better decision. So what we're trying to do when we're meditating is integrate all of those parts together um, so that we can make those logical decisions. Um, so I talked about this, about uh, the brain being the thing that causes us suffering. Our bodies too, right? We've all been injured before. That's, that sucks. Um, that's, the, that's the human condition. Uh, we, we, we suffer, or we have pain. Pain is inevitable as part of our lives. Um, bad things happen. Our bodies experience pain. They, we get old. Um, so pain is inevitable. Suffering is something different. Suffering is a human creation. It's optional. And we suffer. Suffering is the result of a resistance of pain. So suffering happens when something bad happens and we say to ourselves, I wish that wasn't happening. It sucks that that's happening. Or we're in a situation, right? Everybody's been in school, everybody's been in a class and they've been like, this sucks. I wish I wasn't here. I hate this class. <laughs> and that typically makes the experience of that class worse. You're, you're in a reality that you wish you weren't in. It's, and it, it makes you suffer more. So part of meditation is also just accepting reality as it is, fully immersing yourself in the present moment with no resistance. In therapy, we call this like radical acceptance. Um, in general, a lot of times what people are doing is turning away. We're always wanting to turn away from pain. We don't want to feel pain. Um, you know, it's interesting that my job is a room where people come so that they can let their feelings out because we don't do that in the regular world, really. Um, and what we know about therapy is that it actually helps people feel better. So a, a metaphor I use for that is like a rafting metaphor. So if you're rafting and you're about to slam into a rock, counterintuitively, you're actually supposed to slam your body weight into the rock, the side of the raft that the rock's gonna hit because that diverts it down the river. If you lean away from the rock, the raft goes up and flips. So you have to, you have to fight every ounce of what you feel like you want to do to open yourself up to reality, completely accept what's happening, even if it sucks. And counterintuitively, that actually helps you get through whatever it is. Does that make sense? So when you're meditating, your mind might bring you mental resistance of some sort. This is boring, I, whatever. Just, you can watch those thoughts without getting, letting them make you feel a certain way. Does that make sense? Huh. This is a good example too, this last one. Um, so the brain rushes in to kind of cre to, to create that suffering. So when we think about what we're doing when we're meditating is we're getting that to sh just stop. We're trying to get it to just kind of like quiet down. And when you think about like why people like extreme sports and stuff, it's because they're, they're completely one with the moment. There's no mental resistance of what you're doing because you're in it. You don't have time to think about anything else except what you're doing. So when you're doing a snatch, right, are you thinking about that shitty thing that someone said to you earlier in the day? <clears throat> Probably not, because you're, you're completely one with your experience in that moment, and therefore it's very difficult for you to suffer. Now, if you miss your snatch after, now your brain can rush in and tell you, I fucking suck, or whatever it does, right? I can't do this, blah, blah, blah. But now it's taking you away again. Once you're forced into the present moment, you feel great. This is why we love CrossFit. It just makes you, it makes your brain just shut the fuck up for it, however long the workout is. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about these two systems that we have, because this is important. Um, you have that amygdala, right, lizard brain. It's, it's in charge of your survival. It's our animal primal part of our brain. Just wanna see, okay. Um, it's fight or flight. When this thing comes on, you know, let's say a lion rushed in here, all of our, our amygdalas would fire, our prefrontal cortex goes completely offline, we don't need that anymore, there's no time to think, it's no time to reason, we, and we, we act primarily from this brainstem and amygdala. 
when our brainstem and amygdala tell us to do something, we, f we fucking do it because it's in charge of survival, right? So I talked about this with sugar and flour. When you're eating sugar and flour, you're actually getting, your brainstem is actually getting messages to eat more, which is why it causes that craving and addiction. Um, we want to quiet this down. Most of us are in hyper uh, sympathetic nervous system activation, fight flight, frequently um, because we drink a ton of coffee and we work long hours and we come in here and work out. Working out is putting us in that sympathetic fight, you know, fight flight state. Um, when in reality, we should be in the baseline of the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the rest and digest system. This is the system that is in control of things that we're not consciously aware of, like digestion and breathing. I mean, we can be consciously aware of our breathing, but generally we're breathing and we're not thinking about it. We want to spend most of our time in that system, but we don't. Most of us are chest breathing. Most of us are tight and hunched over. We're all in sympathetic nervous system states most of the time. <laughs> yeah, so I could say right now, like, relax your jaw, take the tongue off the roof of your mouth. Like, most of us are, like, tense. Yeah. <laughs> if you disconnected your sympathetic nervous system, you would still survive you would be like in a vegetable state at that point, basically. You would be breathing and your blood pressure would be regulated. If we cut off your parasympathetic nervous system, you would die. So that kind of shows you how that is your primary state, this parasympathetic state. Um, it conserves energy. It's responsible for ongoing steady state activity. It produces feelings of relaxation and contentment. Um, and it's what, when you're in this state, that's what allows that prefrontal cortex to come back online and interpret messages from your brainstem and your amygdala that you get, right? Because we, in our daily lives, we're reacting to a lot of really innocuous things as if they were lions. So I have an anxiety disorder. So what that means is that when I go out to a social event, my sympathetic nervous system is like, you know, it's firing as if there was a threat in the room when there really isn't. Um, so, but most of us are in some sort of state like that. Um, this is when we overreact, right? So if you think about a time you got really, really pissed and you overreacted, that's because you reacted to something as if it was a crisis situation. Your ability to think logically and reason went out the window and you, you flipped somebody off and laid on your horn or whatever you did. And then later you, come, you can calm down, right? You calm down and your prefrontal cortex comes back online and then you say, shit, like did I overreact? Like then you need to go back to the person and apologize or whatever else. All right, so we want to hit the kill switch on that sympathetic nervous system. And there's a couple of ways to do that. I'm going to give you guys my favorite way. This is the way I want you to breathe when you're doing meditation. So I still haven't gotten into how to meditate yet, but I will. Um, this is one part of it. So this, the, and I want you guys to understand the reason why we're doing this. Otherwise, I just sound like a therapist who's telling you to uh, breathe. Yeah, like it sounds therapist-y and not like, why are we doing this? <laughs> But breathing this way really does work to calm amygdala act activation as well as Xanax would. And it actually works faster because when you take a Xanax, it usually takes 5, 10, 15 minutes for that to kick in. You can start breathing right away and calm amygdala activity right away. So you have a muscle called your diaphragm, right? I said most of us are chest breathers. If you think about somebody panicking, it's <sighs> right. That's the breathing that they're doing. Uh, if you watch a sleeping baby or your pet, if you watch your pet when they're asleep, you see their stomach rising and falling, not their shoulders. That's what we want to be breathing all the time. That should be our baseline. Now, if you really do have a threat, you can, you can switch into sympathetic nervous system and use that. So actually, sometimes before I do a heavy lift, I do purposefully <laughs> like chest breathe because I know that that's activating my sympathetic nervous system. Most of the time, though, we want to calm it down. So you have your diaphragm, it sits right under your lungs. When you breathe in, it shifts down so that your lungs can expand and your belly should puff out. So in through the nose, big pregnant belly, out through the mouth, belly deflates and your diaphragm comes back up as your lungs deflate. Forcing that style of breathing, once again, it's in through the nose, big belly, out through the mouth all the way. You're, you're forcing yourself into parasympathetic nervous system activation. Lowers your blood pressure, lowers your heart rate, decreases amygdala activity.
the whole rest of your brain activation will start to fire and then you can like think about things logically. So when we meditate, we're gonna breathe that way. You do, I do like to tell people to consciously push your belly out. So try to make yourself look like you have a pregnant belly when you breathe in. Like I'm pushing my belly out right now with force almost. Okay, this is um, just shows what I'm talking about. Um, so the, the first line is brain activity in normal waking consciousness. You're walking around, you're running errands. Second one is you're relaxed, you're calm. Maybe you're sipping your morning coffee, like relaxed in the morning. This third wave is what your brain looks like when you're meditating and also when you're in level one and two sleep, also known as REM sleep. So I do a special type of therapy called EMDR. It's based on what happens when you're dreaming. When you're dreaming, you're going through rapid eye movement, REM, rapid eye movement. What, what's happening is your eyes are moving back and forth in your head, which is, I'm gonna say a lot of shit right now real fast. It's creating bilateral simulation, which is one side of the brain firing and then the other side rapidly, right? So when I look this way, the left hemisphere fires. When I look this way, the right hemisphere fires. That's helping information cross the corpus callosum, that center of your brain, and it's helping you think about things differently. And it's also helping you make more creative associations between things, which is why we dream about such weird shit, right? So if I was gonna ask you right now, what, what was your first thought when I say the word hot? You're probably all thinking about something I could predict, the word cold, sun, fire, something simple. When you're dreaming, what happens is, is you have a concept and your brain goes several spaces removed from that. So that if I say hot, your brain would go to like volcano, something, something that you wouldn't think of right away. And so that's why dream symbols are so weird because your brain is doing a lot of, it's pulling symbols from a lot of places to make sense. This is why we feel better when we sleep on it. Your brain is actually integrating a lot of information when we sleep. We know that sleeping helps you, helps memory, right? So if you study, it's better to study what you can, sleep for eight hours and then take your test than it is to do an all-nighter. That's been really well researched and proven because your brain is gonna integrate that information that you just learned. If you're studying a bunch of stuff, it's just gonna, it never has time to integrate. So you're putting yourself in that state right? Smooth, calm waves of brain waves, the things, and that's why a lot of deep insights happen when you're meditating. Um, that's why when you're meditating, you're, you are literally changing the landscape of your brain, right? So these habits that we have that are ingrained in us, we're actually able to reconstruct that, those, the neural network, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. The way that you think actually does change the way that you act because thinking and thoughts are a lot like water coming down a hill, right? It's, it creates these deep grooves. And unless you change those grooves, you're gonna keep doing the same shit, even if you don't realize why you're doing it, or even if you don't wanna do it. You're gonna go to the party and you're gonna have the cookie because you just do that. <laughs> um, the third is deep sleep, dreamless sleep. Um, I could say a lot more about that. This is part of it, right? So. Right now, what we're getting closer and closer, if you think about what death is, we think about what would that line look like if you died? Flat. Yeah. So what is happening when we're in deep sleep? No one knows. Um, but when we're in med, you can see how we're getting closer and closer to that through meditation, sleep, and death, those three things. So my favorite quote of all time is, death is a stripping away of all that is not you. The secret to life is to die before you die and find that there is no death. So now I'm back to this third part. We don't know what that is, uh, but I, what I do know is that it has nothing to do with who I am as a person. Um, our thinking mind is attached to what we would consider like an ego state. You know, I'm Megan Mullins. I played sports at UMBC. I'm an athlete. I'm a therapist. I drive a Corolla. Does any of that make me me? Is that who I am? I don't know. And none of that's important, right? In the grand scheme of things, all of that is false. So the idea in meditation is that we are stripping away everything that we think makes us us, everything that we're attached to, everything that we feel like we need to feel important, right? That's ego. I'm important because I blah, blah, blah. In reality, I'm no different than anybody else. We're all the same. We're all this third part, which is basically nothing. Right, so, or we don't know, we don't know what it is, but if I were, another way to think about it is like, if I were to ask you, what is the essence of a room? 
So if we went into my office, it's a room, it's got four walls, there's furniture in the room. What, is the, what makes that room a room? Is it the walls that make it a room? Is it the furniture that make it a room? Well, what really makes it a room is the space between all of that. So that's the room. The room is the, the nothing that is inside the walls that's between the furniture, my organs, my whatever, my thinking brain. That, that, that's the essence of the room is the space. So what we're doing when we're meditating is trying to tap into that space within us that isn't, it's not our thinking mind, it's not our physical body. Um, it's quiet, it doesn't, it doesn't have thoughts. Um, if I were to bulldoze that room, then the space leaks out into everything that there is. It's not a room anymore, but it's not, it didn't, it's still, it's still, it just kind of leaks into everything. So some, and now it says, get a little hippy dippy. So the Buddhist thinking is like, you, you might have heard the quote, like you are, you are a drop of water that carries the whole ocean. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you know, your, your life is like a wave that, that rises and crashes and then recedes back into all that there is. So this is the hippy dip. Now I'm trying to talk to these the spiritual sides of people. You can use that or not. Like I said, I don't know. I think it's possible that this, that there's space and feeling states and energy within us that maybe we don't understand. I also feel like there's where we can get all of our parts of our brain to fire together. We, we just feel really good. <laughs> and that's what meditation does. That's, you know, so I'm going to get into that part now. That's the three parts of the brain I was talking about. Your lizard brain. I'm going to talk about that middle part of the brain is really important. It's in charge of emotions, memories, habits, and attachments. And that's the part that really lights up when we're meditating. The outside is about you know, reasoning, rational, being rational, imagining, imagining things. It's the part that allows us to build big buildings and cities and all of that. Um, I'm actually going to just, well, this is about, this is all this is really saying. This is all scientific proof that Pavlov's experiments make sense, right? That our behavior is shaped over time, that Pavlov was able to ring a bell and present food enough times. He paired those two things together so that dogs started to drool just at the sound of the bell. Drooling is a, a response that dogs can't, they can't force themselves to drool. It's an innate biological response. So when Pavlov, enough times, right, he, he would put food out, ring the bell, dog came and would drool eventually without the food being presented because it knew that when that bell rings, food is coming. If you go to a party, you probably know that that party is associated with snacks, delicious snacks. So on your way to that party, you're having a physiological response that's getting your body ready to eat, probably. It's gonna make you more likely to eat. It's gonna make you more likely to eat whatever it is that you were thinking about eating before you even left to go to the party. That's all that's saying. Um, like I said, the brain likes to take us away from the present moment and it likes to imagine. So what it is also doing, um, it's imagining having the cookie um, in a way that's actually a lot better than actually having the cookie, generally. Uh, when you think about how bad you want a cookie, you're, you're, you're overhyping it in reality, right? Because how good really, it, you guys might argue with this, but how good, really good is the cookie after that first two or three bites? It's all right, it's good, you know, it's good, but like, is it really a, <laughs> uh, Michelle, <laughs> yeah, uh, is the satisfaction of having it really that long lasting? Uh, how much are you thinking about the next bite when you're chewing the first bite that you already took? This is all brain activity that's causing that. So outs, these outside experiences are really incapable of bringing us true and complete satisfaction. They're an unreliable basis for true happiness. So I guess what I'm saying to you is that the cookie isn't going to give you long-lasting happiness, right? You see this a lot of times with people who have spent their whole lives training for something, and then they get their gold medal, Olympians, and then they get extremely depressed. Why? Because they thought that, they thought that the gold medal was going to, that's, that's all they've ever thought about. They've been craving and striving for that. Once they get it, they're like, well, shit. <laughs> The simulator takes you out of the present moment and it sets you chasing after things. Cookies, sex, drugs, things off of Amazon, gold medals. 
they aren't really as great as we think, and they're you're, <laughs> you're ignoring important rewards like the enjoyment of the present moment, whatever that brings you, the people at the party, the experience of being at the party. Um, the things that bring us true happiness is the process of getting to the gold medal. If you lose sight of that, yeah, then yeah, you're going to get to the gold medal and you're going to be like, you, you, if you didn't enjoy and actively keep yourself in the present moment to enjoy that process, then the, get, the gold medal loses its umph. The cookie loses its umph. Um, all right, so what we're going to do with meditation is uh, put the puppy on a leaf. So that thinking mind is a lot like a puppy. It, it wants to go do things and grab things. Like you're at the party, someone's like, ah, you got to try this cake or drinks, whatever, shots, blah. And your, your brain is just like, just, okay. <laughs> so we got to kind of put that back on the leash, uh, train it. Um, we want to remove the obstacles to inner peace, which are craving, suffering, overthinking. Uh, it goes against the evolutionary temp template to undo these causes of suffering. We're used to being pulled around. We're used to going towards pleasure and away from pain. So it is hard. So fighting these impulses is, is difficult. Um, so the diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic breathing is, is a start. It calms down the amygdala activity, which drives a lot of behavior that's automatic. The second part is going to be training your brain. And that, the midbrain, the midbrain is the part that can reflect. So let me just tell you guys how to meditate first. So when I, there's a couple of different ways to do this. Generally, when I meditate, I always start the same way. And this was just taught uh, to me by Buddhist people that I, I, I was Buddhist for like probably two years. Like I practiced, I went and meditated with a Sangha. Who, there's monks that, that, you know, ran that. And I went and stayed in a monastery for a couple of days where they, get, they gave us like meditation instruction. When you're in the gym, you're meditating. When you're focusing, when you're totally present in the moment, you're meditating technically. But you can actively meditate. It's an active state. Let me just start by going through it. So it's an active state. You can be sitting, you can be standing, you can be walking. Generally, you don't want your back on a chair because like I said, it's an active state. I use like a little meditation cushion, but like I could use an ab mat. Will you hand me one of those real quick? Okay. So you could like fold up a pillow or a blanket, but you just want something that your butt's kind of off of so that your hips can like have room to drop down. So if you're meditating traditionally, it's like kind of like this. Your mutra is like your hand position. The only real reason for putting your hands like this is because if, if they start to collapse, then you have like, you want a strong mutra. This means that you're in an active state, you're present. When your brain starts to think and it starts to take you away from what you're doing, your hands generally start to fall because you aren't paying attention anymore. So if you keep them active, that means that you're here now. You know what you're doing. So what I'm doing is I'm breathing in through the nose, big belly, out through the mouth. And you don't have to be extra about it. I'm just doing that for demonstration purposes. And I'm just counting my breathing. So when I breathe in, that's one. When I breathe out, that's one again. That's just my personal preference. You can go one, two, three, four, however you want. I like to go one, one. I think because it just makes me have to focus more um, and it's slower. So I'm thinking one, I'm thinking one, I'm thinking two, I'm thinking two. My brain just noticed that Amy's foot was moving. I heard it do that. It said, look at Amy's foot. It's moving. <laughs> That's a fairly innocuous thought. It's not a dangerous thought. It's not a bad thought. I just, but I just noticed that my mind did that. It took me away from my count. It interrupted my count. And it made me think about that. So I just noticed that it did that. And I go back to one. I reset. One. One. Two. Two. I still haven't had a thought. I'm still focusing on that. It, it will come in. You're, so you count just like that, up to 10. If you get to 10, you're a fucking Zen master. Great, good for you. Then you go backwards, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You know, every time you have a thought, you just notice that a thought came in and you go back to one. So what you're doing is you're training that puppy, right? If my brain was a little puppy, it said squirrel. And I just said, no, not right now. And I went back to focusing on what's right now. My breathing is happening right now. 
I'm focusing on just that. If it's going to think about a lot of things. It's going to think about work. It's going to think about what you have to do later in the day. You just notice it and go back to your breathing. So I think I have one here. I could tell you guys a lot about, this is about what's happening when you're doing that. So when you're doing that, um, oh, the other thing is that happens to me when I'm meditating is that I get to, I'll get to 14. And that is akin to what happens when you read a book page and you get to the bottom and you realize you didn't read any of it. Your brain actually comes in through the back door and it pulled you away. So you're, you are literally not in your body. Your eyes are still moving along the page. Your body is still sitting there like this. But where the fuck are you? <laughs> you're like not there. You're like literally somewhere else. And most of us are not here. If you walk around the grocery store, you look at, especially if you look at people driving, it's actually really fucking scary to know this because you can just see everybody's just like, but we're all just like robots. <laughs> like everybody's mind is like way somewhere else. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're bringing it all back. We're bringing our attention back. When you're doing that, you're, you're increasing activation in your anterior cingulate cortex. It's the middle part of your brain. You can think of the middle part as the bridge. That's the important part. It's the part between this part and this part. It's linking the two so that they can be used together. It's wise mind, the emotional part and the logical part. We want them together so that we can be wise. So that part's activating. That part is the primary overseer of your attention, monitors progress towards your goals, and flags any conflicts among them. Right? So if you leave for the party and you say, I'm going to eat really healthy, and you get to the party and you see a cookie, that's a conflict among your goals. Or if you're eating the cookie, that voice in your head is going to be like, fuck, I'm eating this cookie. Do I want to be eating this cookie? Is this, what I, is this in line with my goals or not? That part of your brain is more likely to fire if you've been practicing this. Um, it influences emotions and it's influenced by them as well. So it, can read, it helps you read emotions in yourself and other people. Um, it's a key site for integrating thinking and feeling. Um, strengthening your interior cingulate cortex through meditation helps you think clearly when you're upset, right? It's gonna keep you less likely to overreact, say things you regret when you're angry. It brings warmth and emotional intelligence to your logical reasoning. Uh, it mod it modul modulates amygdala activity. Um, this is another unusual brain state that occurs during meditation um, as a result of meditation. It involves not reacting to the limbic system. So this is the idea that you can be panicking but aware that you don't need to be panicking. Um, it happens due to prefrontal and ACC activation for understanding and attention, steadiness of mind. Starts initially by ACC oversight and then it's self-organizing, fast gamma wave, entrainment of large areas of the brain, create mental experience of great spaciousness, meaning like feeling like you have plenty of time, you're not in a rush, the feeling of lack of want, that you're content with things just the way they are, and it connects you to this feeling that you're connected to everything. Um, it's also due partially to parasympathetic activation. So this is all just saying like, I talked about a lot of hippy dippy shit, but this has been proven. They studied this, and this is a, a real thing. So for the people that like real shit, this is what's happening when you're meditating. For people that like the spiritual stuff, maybe there's something spiritual happening there too. We don't know. All right, this is the last thing that gets extra activation when you're meditating. It's called the insula. It activates when you experience strong emotions such as fear and anger, as well as when you see other people experiencing fear and anger. It's the part of us that that we develop empathy from. So we have a lot of things in us that help us empathize with other people, that help us understand someone else's experience. And the insula is the part of the brain that's responsible for that. When you're meditating, you're increasing activation of the insula. Women, in general, have more act insula activation than men. We, women are biologically engineered that way because we're nurturers, we care for children. Men are hunters, generally. That doesn't mean you can't increase your insula activation, both women and men, through meditation. Yeah. So you can use the counting. What? <laughs> you can use the counting method. Um, the other way I like to meditate is by just feeling my body from the inside out. So I usually do the counting for like, the, I usually meditate for 15 minutes. You guys are only going to meditate for five. That's plenty. When I first started meditating, I only did two minutes. It's still good. Um, 
I usually experience the most benefit in my meditation from minutes like 10 to 15 now. It usually takes zero to five for me to just like settle down. And then I, then I, I do the counting for the first five minutes. Then I put my attention right at the center of my chest. They call that feeling the seat of your power. So spiritual people might like that. You kind of just put your attention like deep into your chest, like almost towards your back and you just keep it there. And you just like feel your body from the inside out. And it's interesting how quiet your mind will get when you keep your attention there. So I do that for a while, still diaphragmatic breathing. Um, you can do, you can use an affirmation. So some people like to say something that makes them feel good. Like, I don't know, I am good enough. Yeah, whatever. So I'm actually gonna give you guys something to meditate on that's related to, so here, I'll give you this. Actually, you can just take one and pass it down. So you can, you can meditate on your health. You can say, you know, I'm determined like not to put poisons in my body or whatever. That is something that's on there. Um, increasing your awareness of what you're putting in your body, um, whatever. So you can say something. I gener if I'm saying something, I generally like to cut the sentence in half and on the in-breath say half and on the out-breath say half. So if my statement was I am good enough, if I'm trying to offset a self-concept issue, I might say, I am good enough. I am good enough. And I really like to focus on how I feel when I say it. Where is the feeling? What feeling do I get when I say that to myself? And where do I feel it in my body? And focus on that. Um, I gave you guys the mindful consumption meditation. So this is coming out of Thich Nhat Hanh's book, um, let me borrow one of those. So you can see they kind of split it up for you. So you think to yourself on the in-breath, aware of the state of my physical health, I breathe in. Smiling to the state of my physical health, I breathe out. And then I like to meditate on each section a couple of times. So I might go through number one, three or four times. I'm not gonna say that sentence every time, it's too much. So they give you, the, they give you this, the breakdown there. So then I just say, aware of physical health on the in-breath, smiling on the out-breath. Aware of my physical health on the in-breath, smiling on the out-breath. Then I go to the next one. Seeing poisons such as sugar, alcohol, and drugs in my body, I breathe in. Knowing that these poisons are exhausting my body, I breathe out. Poisons in body, exhausting body. And you could do that several times. Then you go to number three, same thing. Then number four, same thing. It's just gonna, the, you know, you can, I don't have to kind of go into the even the science. You can imagine that if you sit there for 15 minutes and meditate on that, you're gonna be way less likely to put poisons in your body throughout the day. That's all we're adding really to this whole thing. Um, if you hate meditating, you can also use this journaling technique. I pair this um, with my meditation. Um, I like to reflect, I do my mind at night, I journal, or in the morning, I journal. <clears throat> I usually reflect on the previous day. I like write down how it went, what, whatever. Um, I write down what I, my intentions for that day, like what I have going on and what I wanna get done or whatever. And then I go through this GLAD technique. I write down one thing that I'm grateful for in the past day that happened, one thing that I learned in the past day that happened, one thing that I accomplished in the past day that happened, and one thing that made me really happy, D, delighted me in the past day. Um, you could focus this around eating, right? So you could just focus the journaling technique on your goals around your maintenance program through the holidays. Um, you can reflect on how you did the previous day with sticking to your goals, what your plans are for the current day and sticking to your goals. I would still write down something you're grateful for and that doesn't have to be food related. We just know that that's actually really good for mood, just reflecting on things that you're grateful for. But you could write something that you learned about your eating patterns in the past day, and you could write down something that you accomplished as far as sticking to your goals in the past day. And that's probably gonna reinforce your ability to stay, do things in line with your goals in the current day. So you can do both, you can do one, or you can journal. So you can meditate for five minutes, you could journal for five minutes, or you can do both if you're trying to just be on top of it. Um, this is just obvious stuff for the holidays. Obviously, like anything that you can do to reduce things that are gonna break down your willpower are gonna help you out, right? So, 
scheduling time for yourself so that you can not be stressed, right? Going for one balanced plate, no snacking, no seconds, right? Generally helps me. That's something we talked about in the seminar, like creating bright lines for yourself so that that thinking mind can't come in and convince you. Well, I'll have a little snack. <laughs> And then you have a little snack and then you have like 80 more snacks because that's what your brain's trying to do. So if you can just set some bright lines and boundaries on that thinking mind, it doesn't even have a chance. You know what I mean? You're, you're just not giving it a chance to come in and convince you to do something that you know isn't in line with what you really, really want. What's going to bring you real true happiness? Feeling really fucking good, right? That's why we come to CrossFit. We want to be fucking fit because when you walk around and you're fit, you, you feel great. You took care of yourself, right? It's fun to go binge drink and drink and eat like shit, but then you feel like shit, really, honestly. So being aware of that can just help you just keep more in line with what you really want. I think that's it. I think I said everything I wanted to say. Does anybody have questions about all that? So this is kind of like leading into the, um, the nutrition, the, the new year challenge, like we'll do a new year, new you, like nutrition challenge. And I'll go way more into the sugar and flour. And now I'm learning a lot about vegetable oils and how horrible they are and just how those substances can hijack your brain. We'll talk more about it. So this would be a good like lead in to the new year challenge stuff too. Which I think that's gonna happen like the second week of January. So we'll do this for 50 days. And then after that, we'll go right into the, the new year, new you challenge. Does anybody have questions? The other things on here are just other things that I use to meditate. So the first one up here in the left is just a simple meditation, right? Just focusing on breathing in. I know I'm breathing in, breathing out. I know I'm breathing out, breathing in. I calm my body, breathing out. I smile, present moment, wonderful moment. So I'm just staying in the present moment. This third one, I actually really like a lot. And I usually end on this one, my meditation. I breathe in. I think the more I have, the more I have to give on the out breath. Then you think, I usually say the more my friends and family have, the more they have to give, but you could put someone you love in that blank. And then you're supposed to pick someone who, who's harmed you or you dislike, right? The more that person has, the more they have to give. And then I do the more everyone has, the more they have to give. I just like to end that way. So I just gave you those three. All right, any questions? All good. Krista has the like uh, stuff that you're gonna keep track. Um, if any, I think the majority of you I have, you guys are in the group or I have emails for, but if there's anybody that like is not in our group or um, you want like a copy of the- Yeah, I can get copies of um, Put your name and email on there. We can get that out to you. And then also if you did like wanna join in, if you're not a part of equity, but you still wanna do the challenge um, or even part of it, um, before you leave, you can take one of these, like if you have access to rowing, um, or even if you want to, um, we can talk about doing like something if you wanted to come in the gym just to kind of work on these things to, to do that, we can um, talk about that as well. So I'll have these up at the front desk, I've got a staple a few more, um, so if you're going to be doing the challenge in here, um, you can pick one of these up. And I think we're going to, like I, um, Meg wanted to do kind of like a tracking board. So we'll use the whiteboard for everybody that's participating. We'll write our names. And then you'll be responsible at the end of each week to kind of put what your new total is, how many meters you're at, how many minutes you're at for your, um, your presence, right, your meditation or journaling, and your push-ups on there just so we can kind of see, all right, this person's crushing it. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. Not, little, not, not competitive. <laughs> keep everybody accountable. And, motivate you to, to keep going throughout that, those 50 days um, there. Yeah. Is it a certain amount per day and that's it or can you catch uh, up? You can catch up, yeah. Okay. So if like you're on vacation or something and you don't have that week available, you can catch up throughout. Yep. Yeah, and you can do the same thing with the minute, meditation minutes. If you miss a day, you just do maybe 10 minutes the next day or whatever. Cool. Thank you all for coming in. I was worried no one would come. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Joe.